But in the end, so then what is that saying? Let's see the ratio. I'm just reading on the top the ratio of percent length change. So does it make sense? It got a percentage shorter. What do we call that? Like what was when something gets shorter? What do we call that? Is it language of this class? It's like brains exploding trying to hold all these things in. When something got 0 0.002 longer or something like that, what do we call that? That's epsilon or shear. Is that right? Shear. All of a sudden, now I'm going. Wait a second. It's epsilon. Isn't that called shear? Strain. It's not strain. It's 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 strain, not shear. So look at the note sheet, it's right here. So, so if something gets shorter, the measurement of what percent it got shorter, we call strain. And notice I'm the teacher and I got, got it confused too. <laughs> so that should, like, this is hard. That's why I stopped to think about it there for just a second. I remembered epsilon, but then I suddenly forgot, oh crap, what, do, what word goes with epsilon? Um, so yeah, so that strain. So it got shorter. So I guess you'd say it had a negative strain in this case, because we compressed it. So it got negatively shorter, but then the width got wider, right? Well, it turns out that, that those two are related. Like how much it gets shorter is going to be related to how much it gets wider. Like there's a relationship between those two. So the ratio of percent length change to or divided by percent width change is actually constant as long as you stay in that elastic range. And remember, we're, everything we do stays in the elastic range. It's kind of cool to understand that it, you know, the bridge won't actually fail if you go beyond that, but since you damage the, damage the material, we don't want to go beyond that. So as long as you stay in that range right there, there's actually a relationship. In other words, you push on this a little bit and you divide those two, you get 0.7. You push on it more, you divide them, 0.7 again. It's the same every single time. And that's, that's what this is saying down here at the bottom. Does that make sense? So what's with the negative sign? Like, why would this not make sense? If I said, okay, it got its length was 0 0.002, it got that much shorter, and then it got this much wider. Yeah, the point is, is one had to get shorter for one to get wider. Does that make sense? What's going to happen if you went the other way? What if I grabbed onto this thing and I started stretching it? Well, now the length gets longer. What happens to the width? It gets smaller. So you see how they both can't be positive? They both can't get bigger. If one gets bigger, the other one's got to get smaller. Well, that's what the negative sign's telling us. That's kind of cool, right? So it's like, that's not hard. So when I say the negative sign reflects the inverse relationship, that's a not very clear but concise way of saying they can't both get bigger they can't both get smaller they got to work against each other what's with lat long yeah i'm actually staring at that now thinking god those are terrible is that something i stole out of the book or did i dream that up on my own because that seems terrible i think it's out of the book because I'm thinking latitude and longitude, like the lines on the earth now. But latitude is latitude's the length, longitude's the width. But long, long sounds like length, doesn't it? So it's like, uh, this isn't that good. As a matter of fact, actually looking it over in my notes, I actually have it, have it backwards. So what do you do if you're in football and you, you have a lateral, you throw a lateral side to side. So lateral is actually the width. So you might add that to your notes, this because I even just said it backwards. Does that matter? It matters in the sense that we're going to be able to look that Poisson's number up in the back of the book and it'd be upside down. Does that make sense? It still would be a constant, it'd just be um, a different constant. Instead of one over two, it'd be two over one. Instead of one half, it'd be 0. 0.5, you know, that kind of a thing, or two. So they can't both be positive. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Just for the fun of it, um, let's go to this back of your book thing here that I showed you. And we've been here a little bit. Look at this over here. 
bam, Poisson's ratio. So actually, this is material based. And again, can you can you appreciate that this had to be material tested and measured? Like there's not some mathematical formula here. So whoever Poisson was, if that's indeed who did this, he basically realized that there was a constant relationship there. But it broke down once you got out of that elastic range, as long as it kind of went springy, springy thing and went back to its shape, then no problem. And and so notice every one of those decimals is, is less than one. What does that imply? If you have two numbers divided and you always get something less than one, what do you know about those two numbers? Which one's bigger? The bottom's always bigger. Let's see, does that, does that make sense? We just said a second ago that, we just said a second ago it was width divided by length. Would the length always get longer than the width? Yeah, I actually think it would, don't you? If you had a, something long and you stretched it this way, isn't it, get, isn't it get a lot longer than it would get narrower? You see what I'm saying? If I raise it an inch this way, it's not going to go an inch that way. So that does make sense, doesn't it? So those numbers are always less. And, and again, it sort of looks like a percentage now. So it feels, and notice you're dividing two, you're dividing two numbers that have the same units. Actually, their units are not, there isn't even a unit there, but this is a unitless number. It's kind of like a percentage. It's like saying it's, it's like saying its width is gonna, that top one is like 35%. Whatever you do to the top, to this length, then this is gonna be 35% of that. You see what I mean? That's kind of cool. So I think the fact that they chose to divide them that way is actually pretty brilliant on somebody's part. Remember that did not have to be divided that way. Um, let's see, they're all, they're all kind of the same. Well, they're all in the 30s and kind of low. And then suddenly there's this 0.15. Like I wonder why is that so terrible? What is that? I'm just thinking out loud and plan this. Oh, concrete. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because concrete's not going to bend much. I didn't, we kind of skipped this section. I only said something about it quickly, but there's ductile and brittle materials. Ductile stuff is stuff that wants to bend. Brittle does not want to bend. So concrete is not very ductile, not very flexible. And so it's going to have a small, that kind of makes sense, actually. That's kind of cool. What's the biggest one on there, I wonder? 0.35, anybody beat that? Nope, 0.35. 36, where's 36? Here it is. So that would be the most flexible material on this chart. And there's some 35s right next to it. So it's not like it was one by a mile, but notice concrete had no close seconds. Like it was way down there. So what is that stuff? Titanium. All the other stuff is, is metal except for plastic and wood down here. And so that must be the most ductile or flexible metal that there is. I don't know anything about titanium, but I'm actually kind of surprised that wood is kind of right in there with all the steels, aren't you? That seems kind of, it seems like you'd be making microscopic measurements though. If you had a piece of steel, like a little bar of steel and you stretched on it, it seems like you're not going to see that with the naked eye. Like you'd have to have something really tight caliper type measurements to even do anything with this. So anyway, that's kind of cool. But what it really means then, because that V is a known number. In other words, if you're, because because one of the things you might start noticing the transition of, but there's going to be lots of questions from now on that kind of tell you what kind of material you're working with. And so if you know what kind of material you're working with, then you can, you know that V number immediately, which means if you know the stretch of something, then you, you don't even have to make a, a difficult calculation in order to figure out how much narrower it got. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like, ah, oh, that's kind of cool that those two things are well linearly related again. Like a lot of the things we've been studying, again, just brilliant discoveries. And some, remember somebody, somebody had to figure this out for the first time. And it's, we're just studying, we're just walking down a trail that someone's marked and GPS and it's all right there. But it's like somebody had to measure this stuff and figure this stuff out. It's just amazing to think about. For the exam two, are we allowed to use the yeah, certainly. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, you need to memorize it. Yeah. Well, I, I know we can find it. If we have information, but I'm gonna print, I'm gonna print a copy of that for you, probably for the test, just to make it a little easier for you so you don't have to flip around. But... Okay, so let's look at the first one. Yeah, it came out yellow. So this is a good straightforward question. And by the way, I'm working on the second test now. For the most part, 
this is feeling more straightforward to me um, as I'm learning it along with you. And I like this question because it's kind of like, hey, look, this is made out of A36 steel, whatever the heck that is. I don't know what that is. Whatever the heck that is, but it just means it's in the back of the book, right? And so if you decided to pull on it with 80 kilonewtons of force, and again, notice they have the force going both directions. Why do they have the force going both directions there? Well, what happens if I pull on this notebook on this side? There's no stretching. <laughs> Does that make sense? Unless it's static and I pull both ways, now it's going to stretch because I'm pulling both directions. So it's still just 80 kilonewtons. But of course, the idea then is, is if you do that, notice that's not compression, that's tension. If I'm pulling that apart, it's of course going to get longer. And what we just learned is, well, it's also going to get narrower, right? And can you appreciate, like this feels like something that'd be really important to know. Do you agree with that? If I have a metal part inside my engine and it's going to have this pull happening onto it as a part of the functioning of the engine, the fact that this thing's going to change size and I should know what that is, that seems, that seems like a thing, doesn't it? So this feels like this doesn't feel hard because um, the formulas are fairly simplistic um, and it feels important. So, I mean, that's kind of cool. Caesar, you had a question? Um, just because of the A36, when we do the electricity, it's going to be 20, it's in PSI, the uh, PSI, and that's all in uh, metric. Yeah, that's right. So the table in the back of the book, um, there's two tables. One is met, one is metric and one is standard. They're the exact same table, but they're two totally different sets of units. So on the top, I got it highlighted up there, US customary units. So that top one is PSI, inches, pounds. The bottom one, SI units, that's the metric stuff. So you definitely want to, you know, that's the kind of thing I wouldn't take too many points off on a, on a test for, but of course, again, in the real world, everybody died, right? So let's not get this wrong. So let's see, A36, and yeah, you noted that this problem is in kilonewtons. So that means I'm down on the bottom, and so I need to find A36 structural steel. And you may have noticed already, and this is going to be a, a pattern that continues, but that comes up a lot. And maybe it's not surprising because it's called, I said this the other day, but structural steel, like it's for structures. Like this is one of the, it's probably why it was made. And so, cool. Notice I have 200 gigapascals for elasticity. And just because I'm sitting here right now, notice there's also modulus of rigidity number, like how rigid is that material? We'll need that in the next section, but it's like, there's a number that we're starting to understand now. Um, and then I'm all the way over here at the right, stealing 0.32. Okay, cool. So I know it's Poisson's ratio. I know the relationship between how much wider and how much longer, which means if I can somehow figure out how to get one of them, then I'll just kind of get the other one for free. Does that make sense? So 0.32, I'm stealing that out of the back. Maybe I need those other numbers. I haven't really thought about it, but I know I need that one, so. Um, I'm kind of distinguishing uh, my, rather than writing just a normal V, I'm going to kind of write a V that looks like that. So, okay, cool. Um, the other reason this isn't hard is because we've actually already done some of this. Like, didn't we already find strain before? Like you pulled on something, we already figured this out once before. All we're really doing in this section is saying, well, now that you know the strain axially, is that word starting to mean something to you? That's kind of an important word, axial or along the axis. So this is being pulled along its length, its longer direction. And so that's an axial force, which is often how materials like this are used. That's, it's like that, um, just like on a post, um, you know, a post that holds up part of your house, that post is vertical. And so the force is pushing down on it. So it ends up being an axial along the axis kind of load. And so it's like, I already know how to find that strain. Well, honestly, I'm like, well, I, I knew. <laughs> Last week I knew, but I don't know if I know now, and I'm actually not kidding when I say that. Um, I got to look up the formulas. I got to think about that. I don't know. I don't just immediately know. So this kind of like, oh, if I get that, then I could just convert using Poisson's ratio, and I'll know what happens to the width of it too. That's kind of cool. So let's see if we can get this back. Let's see. Strain was. Oh yeah, that's right. I actually, rem I remember this. Wasn't it V over A? In other words, the shear force. Is that right? Is it normal force over area? Sigma is normal, right? Yeah. 
No more work. Yeah, so no, this isn't the right formula. Like I was trying to pull that out of my head. What is the strain formula? That's not it. That was actually shear strain formula that I just wrote there. Shear strain from the last section. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confused keeping this. Yeah, this is like the change of the length divided by the length. And so, you know, I'm having to stare at my note sheet too, right? I've seen so many different things. And in your note, she even has a little zero down there, which is just to kind of remind you that's its initial length and you're dividing by its initial length, not its new length, which again, as a percent makes sense. If it's going to grow, it grows from what it used to be. Oh, okay, cool. So I was wondering how we find the change of L with that information we have. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm thinking the same thing you are right now, which is how do I, I mean, I know the original length is 1.5 meters. That's the only thing I kind of feel like I know immediately. But if you go to your book, you can have, you can have the strain signal. No, because strain is how much longer something gets as a percentage. So that's not something you're going to get in the table. You got to calculate that somehow. Good, calculate our stress and then you can plug that into the modulus of elasticity and then you can plug that back in. Yeah, I think you're thinking there. Like, didn't we say that E was equal to stress divided by, I'm sorry, yeah, stress divided by strain? So it does make sense that the hard thing to calculate here is delta L. In other words, how much longer is this thing going to get? So is there some way to find strain? Well, it turns out, yeah, but it but it's not immediate. There's no like a direct formula for it. I got to find it as a part of this formula. So you're right on it, Thomas. I can look E up in the back of the book. I can find the normal stress because I know how much, notice the direction that force is pulling in is in the normal direction. So if I take that normal, remember this normal stress was the actual force which is, I'm going to write 80,000 Newtons there divided by that area. And this E was something, wasn't it 200 a second ago? I just, I didn't even know we needed that, but wasn't it like gigapascals or something? And I know the area, I know the cross-sectional area of that because I have dimensions there. And so then the only thing that's not in that equation is epsilon or the strain, and now I know the strain. So it's like, wow, you know, these are, this is not obvious, right? So actually this is kind of, you know, back to sort of the top of the note sheet that you have in front of you. So let's see, gigapath, and of course the units here are something you really wanna pay close attention to, not just to get the problem right, but because you'll see in a section or two that it's like, again, so helpful, the units can actually tell you what to do. So there's a part of me that wants to call that 200, whatever billion Newtons per meter squared. Isn't that what a Pascal was? Newton? Newton per meter squared, yeah, because it was a force divided by a distance. So there's a part of me that wants to call that two billion or whatever it is. Giga was nine, so that'd actually be 200 times 10 to the ninth. K was three zeros, mega is six zeros, giga is nine zeros. So I could think of this as 200 times 10 to the ninth meters, I'm sorry, um, Newtons per square meter. So everything is Newton square meters. And if that's the case, then that means my area needs to be in square meters as well. Again, I don't, I don't know if this is the approach the book would take, but I just find myself the first time through this, always wanting to go back to the basic units so I don't screw something up. So my area, well, what's that cross-sectional area? Well, yeah, notice it's 50 millimeters by 100 millimeters. So isn't that 0 0.05 meters times 0 0.1 meters? If I want to make that square meters, do you see how both sides are Newtons per square meter if I do that? So that's going to kind of guarantee I don't screw this up. So, and all of that is divided by epsilon. So that's the only unknown I don't have there. So I guess then what this is saying is if I took 
epsilon and multiplied it over to the right hand side, then I'd have this 80,000 over here divided by 0 0.05 times 0 0.1, and then I'd be dividing by 200 times 10 to the ninth power, which you could type that in because you have a graphing calculator. You can you don't have to type two zero 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 zero. I don't know about you, but when I get about nine zeros out there, I can't even tell how many I typed. And so I'm going to type that just like I said, 200 times 10 to the ninth. Yeah, quick question. Yeah. How did you know? Because I was trying to do 1.5 times like 100 millimeters. Because I thought since we were pulling actually that 1.5 meter would come into play. Not for not for this calculation because this part of it, um, it'll come into play when I get back back over here. But it actually doesn't make any difference how long that is in terms of the PSI force that's pulling on it. And practically speaking, if that bar was a foot long or 500 feet long and I was pulling on it, it wouldn't make any difference. It doesn't, doesn't change how anything's behaving. I mean, now it would get longer. I mean, it would, percentage wise, it's going to have a longer strain. So let's see. If I don't screw that up, then if I punch all that in, I'm getting E. And, and, and I'm, I think I'm going to add long to it. Isn't that the right one? Latitude is width. Yeah, length, the length, E length then comes out to be 0 0.0040 and an eight. Um, perhaps I should be rounding that different, whatever, close enough. And in this case, that would be millimeters per millimeter or meters per meter, I guess. But notice that is not surprisingly ridiculously tiny. Why is that ridiculously tiny? Because this thing is, go ahead, Ian. Steel. It's like, it's not going to get much longer, man. You're not going to measure that with a tape measure, right? It's like, it's not going to get much longer. This is a meter per meter. I mean, more realistically, because these are tiny, it'd probably be millimeters per millimeter. But I mean, it could be miles per mile. It doesn't matter what it is because it's unitless, really. But, but if you wanted to take a stab at measuring it, it would have to be in millimeters because it's ridiculously small. Can they test this? They do it with like, they do it with like a small piece of steel, like you showed us. That's exactly right. I think it's a one half inch diameter piece of steel. And it has threads on the end to give it a way to attach, but the only part they're paying attention to is the middle two inches. That's what I've gathered. I haven't watched that happen before, but it does it take a ridiculous amount of force, even with that small piece of support. Yeah, I, I think it still is pretty massive. Yeah. I think the forces are the, those generators still just massive because you do have to pull it far enough for it to be measurable. Yeah. But as I said, they're not actually putting a tape measure on that. They have a couple of electrical leads on it. They're somehow measuring based on like electron lengths or something and something really accurate. But you know, that number is that number is terrifyingly small. Does it make sense if I change that to 0.79? Part of me thinks, oh yeah, that's pretty close. But no, if I'm dividing by that number, it's going to make a big difference. So it's just a question of you know how accurate do I need to be? Okay, well, Rad, that means I actually know this value right here now. And so I can actually figure out how much longer that's going to get. That's what we did before. Um, does it make sense that because I wrote, because this E, this epsilon is unitless, does it make sense because I called the bottom 1.5 meters, the top is going to be in meters automatically, which is probably not a good idea. Because the change in length is not going to be measured in meters. It'd probably be better if I turned this into millimeters by calling it 1500 millimeters, and that way the units would be in millimeters. Does that make sense? That'd probably be a better plan. So I guess all I need to do is multiply 1500 by that number. Um, if that number was still sitting in my calculator, which it is not, um, I'm going to go ahead and use the 0 0.008 number, but if, if you had that number sitting in your calculator, you'd be better just to leave it there and say times 1500, wouldn't you? Your answer would be better than mine if you did that. 
So when I did that, I got point one two. Now again, let's stare at these two numbers for just a second here because I find myself, and I bet you will too, kind of getting confused between those two. Like even when I was just talking about it, I was thinking of that 0 0.008 is how much longer it was getting. Let me say that again. When I got that 0 0.008, I thought that's how much longer it got. But remember, that's a percentage. That's not how much longer it got. What I just did and got 0.12, that's how much longer it got. You see what I'm saying? How much longer it gets is a function of how long it was. 0 0.008, you know, eight kind of a percent type of number is really tiny, but if that bar was five miles long, it's gonna get pretty long. It's gonna get a lot longer. It might be three feet longer. You can appreciate a bridge. I got a cool calculation to show you on that. I, I mentioned the other day, I'm designing, helping a friend who actually designs bridges and I'm just doing part of the work and, and it's bolted. It's this long I-beam piece of steel, but but it's gonna get longer, not because there's force on it, but because there's heat. And one of the things we'll talk about next is thermal expansion and how if something gets warm, it gets longer. It isn't just force. Force causes this to get longer, but heat gets, makes it get longer. So there's no force on a bridge pulling it like this. So you don't have to worry about that, but you do have to worry about getting warm. And so as a result, you can't just put a bolt in it because if you do, the bridge is gonna to stick to the bolt, and lift up or break the bolt off. So instead of drilling a hole for the bolt to go through, you drill a slot so the bolt, so it can actually slide along. And it's like part of his design. I was like, God, that stuff is real. Like we're, this is just like a class. I mean, we're, you actually use this stuff. This is just crazy, you know? Um, so just staring enough to kind of see the difference between those two numbers. Don't forget epsilon, the strain is actually a percentage. It's not a length, it's a percent of the length which is exactly why we had to multiply it by 1500, right? You took the percent times how long it was to figure out how much it actually grew. But as I said, they're both tiny numbers. And so I found kind of myself getting confused about you know, which one is which. Um, in this example, I'm not gonna change this, but notice they actually drew an X, Y, Z axis on this because all three of those dimensions are gonna change under this force. What I could call what I just did is like delta Z because it's actually changing in the Z direction because the second from a little bit from now, we're gonna have to find out what did it change in X and in Y. So calling that delta Z might've been a good idea. Okay, cool. So what good does all that do? Well, now, because we sort of have our, we have sort of one of our shear numbers then we can use Poisson's ratio to figure out what happens in the widths. Does that concept make sense? I know the length change because that's the only thing I can calculate is, is stress, normal stress, because the force is pulled in that direction. And as a result of that, now I can say, okay, cool. Well, it turns out that 0.32 that we looked up is equal to, let's see, that was E, or epsilon latitude divided by epsilon longitude. And again, my first thought was, oh, that's what I figured out that 0.12 for, but that's not what goes there. The epsilon goes there, not the 0.12. You see how there's like two numbers that sort of represent what happened lengthwise and I could totally get confused about this. And so, no, it's actually not that one. So I'm putting in here, my 0 0.0008 number. And what's missing from my formula? I left this out on purpose till now, but the negative sign, because if I don't put that in there, then this is gonna look like it got longer, right? So this is really negative. So it's like, oh, that's easy. I just take 0 0.008 and times 0 0.32. And then I know the latitude, right? Lateral. So it's only 32%, right? It's only like, it's like a third. Whatever the other one moved, this is only gonna move like a third of that. And mine went into scientific notation. So I got, so yeah, smaller, smaller than eight. 
like a fourth. It's some change on it, which is why it's actually a third. So again, is that how big the is that how big the sides change? No, it's the percent. It's the percent of how the sides changed. And so now I can take that percentage just like we did a second ago and multiply it by the length of each of those and figure out, you know, what it is I'm I'm after. So if I want to know, like I'll write it this way. If I say I'll say change of L in the X direction, or I should just, I could just say X, whatever, versus the length in the X direction. So for us, that means that negative 0.1234 zeros and 256 is equal to the change of X, L in the X direction, which I don't know, change of LX, but I do know the original length in X. What's that original length in the X direction? Oh, that's the 100. So it was 100 wide. So just like it's getting pulled on when it was 1.5 meters, it's just getting pulled on sideways. It's just that it's getting smaller. So I notice I would want this to be millimeters because I want the change of LX to be in millimeters too. I don't want that to be in meters. And I'm lucky here because I'm multiplying by 100. So I just know I'm moving the decimal point two places to the left. So instead of four zeros, I just have two. And now that I've multiplied by millimeters, that actually is millimeters. So isn't that kind of cool? Like we actually know it got that much smaller in the width direction. So does that mean for every millimeter you pull lengthwise, that's how much it reduces the width? Well, that's more like what this number is telling you. This number says that's how many, and that's why your book oftentimes does not leave that alone. They could call it millimeters per millimeter. In other words, every millimeter of width, it's going to be that many millimeters smaller, 0 0.00026 millimeters smaller. That's what the advantage of leaving millimeters per millimeter. So every millimeter of length, you're going to get that much smaller. Well, we have 100 of those. So that's why we multiplied by 100. And that's why the, this, is, this number here is kind of so much bigger. That's literally how much, how much narrower that width got. So notice that's still pretty darn close to 100 millimeters, right? It, but it's whatever, 99.997 now. So it's a constant. Like that. What's a constant? That epsilon constant. Um, right. that that's right. That's exactly right. It's kind of like a ratio. It's like saying for every gallon of milk you drink, you'll gain two pounds. But it makes sense too because that would be if it is eighty millimeters. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because in a sense, this number over here can be thought of as unitless because it's millimeters divided by millimeters, and those could cancel. So then, when I multiply hundred millimeters over here, that turns into millimeters, and this is left then to be. I guess that's millimeters. So this is. I guess I was just. I was like, well, how far is it pulled? I guess we're pulling it 80 kilograms. So that goes all the way back to the very beginning. Yeah, that's right. 80 kilograms. So that's that's the difference of us pulling 80. That's exactly right. That's that's only because of 80. If you change that, then this all changes. Right. The only thing that's really constant here is 0.32, the relationship between the two. Yeah. That's why it's constant. Yeah. So I should be using something like length, width, height, or distance in X, distance in Y. I mean, calling them all length maybe is a little confusing. But at least if I put X and Y in there, you understand what I mean. So notice our, our epsilon value hasn't changed. Both of these are latitude. Does that bother you? You know, I think of latitude as left and right, but it also counts as this direction because it's not it's not in the length direction. So whether it gets narrower this way or this way, it's kind of the same. If I turn the bar this way, then all of a sudden what used to be the width is now the length. You see what I mean? So both of these dimensions share that lateral percentage. But notice the the uh, the length of y is actually only 50 millimeters. 
gets much smaller. Well, the percent of that then, when I multiply by the percent, it's not going to be as much, it's not going to be quite as big as the other one was. Remember that this number right here could have been 50 miles. If that was 50 miles, then this right here would be a pretty, I'd really make a change. But you know, it's only 100 millimeters. That's, so that's not very much, as a percent, that's not very much movement. Hey, my wife wants to know about engineering. Isn't that fun? So I punch that in. And I get the change of length in Y is negative again, implying or telling us that it got smaller, 00128. And it makes sense because 500 is 50 is half of 100. So this number is half the size um, as, as the one we just calculated a minute ago. So in one sense, this is a, a fairly simple calculation, but because the, the percentage amount and the length amount are so similarly tiny, I, I, it feels a little confusing to me. Like I got to kind of go slow not to screw this up. But it is kind of rad to think if you look back at everything that I have boxed now, I'm going to go back and kind of box this one. Like I pulled on that with 80 kilonewtons of force and I now know how all three dimensions changed. That's kind of cool. And incidentally, maybe you know some things about, you know, part of me thinks like, well, yeah, they're all the same. Like realistically, are those really point? I mean, even the big one, 0.12 millimeters. I mean, a millimeter is hard to even measure. And now we're saying it's like 12% of that. <laughs> like, but remember, think about things like cars, pistons sliding inside of cylinders. The tolerances on that stuff are thousands of an inch. If it hits, if the cylinder, if the piston inside the cylinder got smaller in its width, then the oil is going to pass by it and then be burned out the back and so forth. Like these, these aren't just, you know, random numbers. If this is on a bridge, then I think, yeah, whatever, who cares? If it's got 0. 0.000 millimeters longer, so what? But with respect to the way some pieces of metal interact with each other, that can matter. Obviously, the main thing is just like, God, that's amazing. You can figure that stuff out, isn't it? Isn't that rad? And remember, we're predicting the future here. All we know is what kind of steel it was. We haven't done it, but we, we can know ahead of what it's going to do. Unbelievable. Going away. I got a curiosity. Go if I plug in two, you know, two point five six to the negative fifth, and I try to do this whole thing for length and speed, even though we already got it at zero point one two, I get a different answer. So why does it not work? I just was wondering if it would work if I just plugged it in, plug and chug for the length of speed. In other words, you took that point zero 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 two six and multiplied by that other length. Yeah, but that's because you're you're pretending that your mistake is you're pretending that the the strain numbers for latitude and longitude are identical and they're not. The way that first L, the first delta L, the point one two, that was our that was the unit. Yeah, that's exactly right. So maybe I'll go back there and throw the Z in there. And the only reason that one is bigger is because number one, its its strain was almost three times as big, 0 0.008 instead of 0 0.0256. And it was 1500 millimeters long, which is really long relative to the other ones. So, so yeah, I'm glad you said that because these two are not the same number. This is one of those things where I feel like we have you as a forest guide so we don't get lost. And then the second I go home, it's like, yeah, what am I doing? Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. <laughs> Take some time, and that's kind of why I want to slow down and just kind of soak on this a little bit. It's kind of weird, like this is. I find myself getting confused with these two. This is not something I don't think anybody's ever going to sit down and just kind of do while they're watching TV. I mean, I think you got to concentrate, especially because the numbers are so weird. You got to be really careful. Well, they're also so. Yeah. Like I'm writing epsilon everywhere. Epsilon is everything. Yeah. Yeah, epsilon is kind of everywhere. 
and I might armed with that in terms of what I'm going to print off, you know, it might be a good idea to write. Those are lati latitudes, strain, latitude, epsilon, latitude, kind of in the perpendicular direction of the force. Because remember, the other thing I want to say, just as a side note that maybe is confusing, but that axial pull makes sense. But what if there had been a force this way? Does it make sense that's the shear direction? So does it make sense if that was the force, it would have worked too? It's not, it's not just that, you know, we always think of length as like the longer one, but it's like if that force was pulling there and, you know, pushing here and pushing there, then, then effectively this dimension would have been the longitude dimension because that's the direction that the force is. You see what I mean? Typically, because in, you know, wave real materials work, they're typically doing some kind of a job and their length is kind of the issue. And the forces being in that direction are kind of what what ends up applied to them all the time. Like I said, a post on a house, you know, sit this way, and there's like the roof is sitting on it, so all the force is going down it. So just naturally, that ends up. I'm kind of making this up, but like 80 percent of the time, like that's where the force actually is. Unfortunately, these questions won't be confusing. Like the the length, the length will be the, the place the force is. They're not going to put the force on there in that way that I just described. That even though you totally could. So it's kind of in the direction of the forces is the is the longitudinal direction, and then the other two forces are the other two directions are perpendicular to that, so they're in the lateral direction. So from there, lateral would be sideways, right? Like lateral would look like that. So whichever direction doesn't matter which way you go, that way that's lateral, that's lateral. So this is the longitudinal way. It just doesn't that just doesn't look right with the drawing because longitudinal usually means long, like the length of something. So. So we did latitude of y angles because we're going left or right or up or down. Yeah, it's kind of like we're going the perpendicular options we have from the 80. So we went that way because that's lateral. Right. And that way, and this way, and this way. So any of those things would be a football player throwing it sideways from where they're aiming. You know, I'm going towards you and I'm lateral that way, lateral that way. Let's see. Actually, let's do. Oh, this is a good one. Let's do it. So Notice this is an interesting question. Ignore the weird arrows on it for a second, but notice what they tell us here is there's a plug inside that that's 30 millimeters diameter. And then there's a sleeve around it that's 32 millimeters in diameter. So does it make sense that the plug inside there can slide in and out because there's like some space? There's two millimeters of space, which would mean one millimeter on each side. And so that could slide around inside there and everything's great. And you can imagine, you know, some kind of a part of an engine where you'd want that to be sliding, right? That's kind of the part of, that's the point of this. Even something as simple as I'm pushing a button, well, I have to have some shaft to kind of hold it and then the button slides through it. So that kind of makes sense. But does it make sense if you pushed on that plug and it wasn't able to move that it's gonna get wider, in which case it could like stick on the sides of it? Well, that's kind of what this question is getting at. So they're both 50 millimeters long. So this thing is, the plug is the same length as that pipe is, if you will. And notice they said the axial pressure P. Do you see the word axial making sense there? Because what, what direction is that going? Well, along the axis, it's, it's pushing this direction. It's not sideways. It's not coming in from the sides. So axial needs to mean something here. I've seen that a ton of times in engineering that I've done with construction. And I remember like before this class, I didn't have a super good feel of what that meant. Now I do. What is the opposite axial? That's a great question. I wasn't going to ask it, so it's come up now like three times. I mean, I want to say shear because, because remember when we had a, a section of something like this, we said shear was in this direction and that was normal. So normal was kind of the axial direction and shear was perpendicular to that. So I want to say 
normal in shear. That says normal is kind of synonymous with axial. Yeah, I mean, this class is, is you know, every math concept you've ever learned, but it's also like a brand new language. It's like foreign language and math all, all together with physics. <laughs> it's hard. So notice they told us some stuff because they never told us what it was made out of. Do you see what they told us right down here? They told us what we just looked up in the back. So, okay, whatever. I didn't, it doesn't matter. They could have told me the material and I could have looked it up myself. Well, okay, don't tell me what it is, but just tell me, tell me what E is and tell me what V knew. Notice in the back of the book, there wasn't any materials that were 45%. That's just kind of interesting. So obviously this author just kind of made this up, but there's probably more materials that are available than just what's there. So let's see, they said, determine the axial pressure that must be applied to the top of the plug to cause it to contact the sides. So that means the sides have to grow from 30 to 32, right? And then it'll touch the side. It was 30 wide, the diameter of that plug was 30. And if I shove down on it, Whoop, gets wider and then shorter. And it will get shorter. So it's going to get shorter. It's going to get wider. So it'll drop from the top. It won't be even with the top anymore. So it's like, yeah, I can see how that, that would make sense. And that's kind of in the vein of what we're talking about here. So, well, what do I know? Again, I find this confusing. I'm just going to start writing stuff down. Like, so that's 0.45, and that's equal to the E. He said latitude was on top because it was smaller than longitude. I'm just writing down the formulas that I know. I'm throwing in that negative sign. <clears throat> so I know that. So there's that's one of my tools. And right now, I don't know either of those other two numbers. But it's like, OK, there's one of my tools. That's cool. Um, I've got sigma equals normal over area. This is kind of the axial direction. <laughs> formula. I've got E equals sigma over epsilon. I got that formula. Like those are kind of my tools. I'm just, I don't know what to do. So is this is this plug 32 meters in diameter? 30. It's, 30. it's going to be 32 when we push down on it, but it's 30 right now. And then we're going to put force on it. Well, no, I mean, I mean like casing, I guess. That is this whole thing 32 and then the plug is 32. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. It's like a pipe. It's hollow. So it's like those are the only formulas I can think of. So again, I, rather than like trying to solve anything, I just feel like I don't know. I'm too dumb to do this in steps. So it's like, is there anything I know? Well, I know the I know the area of the plug, don't I? You know well, the area, you know the area of the casing. Well, I know it's 30 for a diameter, so isn't that pi divided by four? And 30 millimeters is 0 0.03 meters. So it's like, I know the area of the plug. And that's before. But you're trying um, to find the maximum uh, force, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm trying to model like the only way I think a person can get this kind of stuff right again six months from now. I could show you this in steps and make it look like it wasn't hard. And don't I know E is five megapascals? I'm going to go ahead and just leave that because I don't want to write all those numbers, but I'm thinking to myself that's a five with six zeros. So by itself, so far, I'm not very happy with anything I have there because I have my top equation has two unknowns. My middle equation still has two knowns. My bottom equation has two unknowns. Like, you have Well, I thought we had a train, but we don't have a train. We do have a train. What's that called? We have uh, the latitude. You know that's supposed to be two no, no, the change of right. The width is supposed to be, or maybe it's one.
So I'm, I'm feeling stuck. I have three equations and all three of them have two unknowns and they're not talking to each other. Like there's not two equations, two unknowns there. I'm kind of stuck. And you guys were talking amongst yourselves. Do you have any ideas here? Well, we know that we're supposed to increase from 30 to 32 millimeters. Listen to what he's saying because he's got oh, it. Oh, yeah. So we know the change in the thing. So it's going to be a oh, one millimeter. Yeah, a one millimeter increase for the. Yeah. And we also know that. Yeah. Very interesting. We know that Delta helps. So we need a strain of. Yeah, don't I actually know that E latitude is, let's see, it's the change divided by the original, right? How much did it change in width? Two millimeters, because it went from 30 to 32. It's the entire width. It used to be 30, and now it's 32. So it got up two, right? Two millimeters? Yeah, we got to think about that. Like, should I be putting negative in there? Uh, the answer is no, because it got bigger. Okay. It's plus two. It didn't get minus two. It's plus two. So it should be positive. And then original length was 30. Aha. So I actually know one thing here. Did you agree that's not obvious? Like, hmm. So two divided by 30 is point, oh, that's nice, is point zero six 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 six. I'm going to get lazy and call it that. So now I have one of those numbers. What good does that do me? Yeah, so I'm tempted to plug it in at the top. For sure, I can plug it at the top. I'm I'm suddenly a little nervous about the bottom. Is that okay? Is that is this is this longitude or latitude or does it not matter? Oh wait, oh, let's see. Uh, basically, we can plug it into the top. What do you mean? It's normal stress, so it's longitude. Yeah, is that? Let's look at our note sheet. Well, let's do the top first. We know that for sure. So if I if I throw this in up here, and notice what this is going to do because the this time the the width grew, but the length is going to get short. So the negative is actually going to go to the length. You see what I'm saying? So the, that's kind of cool. That's right. That's right. The force is going to be applied directly to the length. And so it is going to get shorter. So if I take that number that I just got, which is still sitting in my calculator, by the way, and I divide by 0.45, I end up with that E longitude is negative 0.1481. And that is still unitless or millimeters per millimeter. So now I kind of have both of those. And so, okay, cool. Yeah. So the side's going to get small, the side's going to get wider by a percentage of 6%. You understand that again, that 0 0.0667 is, is a percent. So it's like 6% wider. That's pretty big growth. And the length is going to get like 15% shorter. So remember, those are percentages, not lengths. They're millimeters per millimeter or unitless. Now, I am genuinely confused, um, genuinely. So now I actually have, it's good that I did that first because I sort of have two E's now, does that make sense? Like which, is it true that the longitude? Well, we the, what is being applied in the normal direction? So is it only affecting the lattice? Normal as well. Oh, yeah, long. Yeah, let's take a look at the, Let's take a look at this note sheet here. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, yeah, see, there's some stuff I left off this note sheet. And now that I'm looking at it a little bit more, I, and I, I did put it here, but notice what it says right here. Normal is axial. So right up here, I remember taking off the phrases normal stress and normal strain. It's kind of like, well, of course they are. That's because at the time when I was learning this, that's the only thing we talked about. Like the, 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 the forces were pushing on the length of it, which always made the length shorter or longer. So it was always the length. Like, oh yeah, it's always the length. Well, now all of a sudden we're saying, no, oh, it could be the width too. And now all of a sudden it's confusing. Like that should actually say normal stress and normal strain. And, and so, like I said, I, I did kind of keep it down over here. So yeah, it is actually the epsilon long that's got to go in that. You see what I mean? Well, we plug we plug the normal strain into the uh, or into the latitude, and that's how we got the point zero or sorry point one four h. So did we do that wrong? No, we did it right because this was the point zero zero six was the lateral point zero six six seven was lateral, and we plugged it in there, and then that Poisson's ratio gave us the longitude, the epsilon yeah, so longitude out. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, Take the your time. Equation. What is that equation? That's the, the fact that our E latitude is the change in L over L. But the, that's our, on our note sheet, number two, the strain. Which I would assume is normal strain, right? Well, that's, yeah, I mean, here, because I'm calling it length, you know, again, I'm thinking of that as the long dimension, like, how long is this pen? None of you are going to give me that size. Right. You know, when I say long, I mean, well, the long one, you know, yeah. um, but what we're learning today is like, there's three dimensions to something. And so they all change. And so, yeah, back when we talked about stress and strain, when those first three were the only notes we had, it was always longitudinal. And so we just kind of left it off. But now all of a sudden it's like, oh, actually, that's important. We can't just leave that off. I'm just confused on how we decided that was the width instead. What we just calculated? Oh, I see. Never mind. That's just because it got wider. Because we chose the width. Yeah, we chose that. We were told it was going to get wider. It got bigger laterally by two. That's exactly right. So if I put that negative 0.148 number in there for epsilon down here, because we realize now this is actually longitudinal, then and pay attention to this for just a second. Notice that the unit for E, I just left it as five megapascals. Technic technically, epsilon is unitless. So I got 0 0.7407 when I multiplied 0.1481 times five. And since this was megapascals, then that means this would also be megapascals. If that was in the back of the book, that's not what I would see. I'd see 70, what would I see? 740.7 .7 kilopascals. But nothing wrong with that. The main thing I want you to see in this is, do you see how I kind of let algebra do my thinking for me? Like, I'm way too dumb to figure this out, step one, step two, step three. But if I just say, well, what formulas do I have and start plugging in stuff that I know, then in the end, it's kind of like, oh, equation four went back to equation one, which then took me to equation three, and now finally to equation two. I mean, do you see how terrible it looks? 
But my opinion as a teacher is if I just did that in the correct order, then I'd make this look like it was easy, but it's not. And it's only easy if you're memorizer, it. it's only easy if you're doing another problem exactly like it. But what I'm trying to illustrate is you got a bunch of formulas, just plug it over. If you see N, if you're told N is 17, plug it into all 17 formulas that have an N in them. Let algebra speak. Everything's related. That's kind of what we're learning here. Yeah. Do we keep that negative sign for the E long? Uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I didn't, I was lazy about that. Does that matter or not? What do you guys think? Because I did not keep the negative sign because when I multiplied negative 0.148 times five, I should have got negative 0.74. Um, do I care? It is direction, and the fact that it's negative is what's telling me that that longitude and direction is going to get smaller. So as long as you kind of had in your mind, yeah, I'm pushing down and it's going to get smaller, then maybe you don't need the negative. But it's kind of good to have it because it's kind of reminding you it's going to get shorter. And basically what it's telling you is it's under compression. Negative is under com it's compression. So if you let the signs kind of you know, take care of themselves, then negative would mean compression and positive would mean tension, I guess, in this context. So yeah, I'm glad you said that because I didn't think about it. I just disappeared it. It's okay to disappear if you did it consciously, but I didn't. I just disappeared it. <clears throat> so I don't know whether to include it or not. I guess I probably should. So we we arrived and that's that's our yeah. Well, it's it's your PSI is the problem. It's pounds per square inch, it's not pounds. Um but, but yes, is, is the answer to that. We, ha we have arrived because the way they worded this is a little bit weird. Notice there's like a whole bunch of arrows on there. And so if we want to describe what, what's pushing on that as a stress, PSI, kind of a number, I mean, it's metric, but, but it's like, yeah, P is PSI, because they didn't really say what that meant. Is it, is it just pounds or is it pounds per square inch? Do you see the, the difference between those two? A lot of times we had just one arrow and it would say like 80 pounds. Another time it's like 8,000 PSI or something like that. So it's like, is it force or is it force per area? We could make it just a force. If you know the radius, and it'll be all over the world by the center. If it's PSI, we need to convert the millimeters to so, inches. So, so this is the answer in the back of the book for this question. Do you see that? because we are done. If I move that three places to the right, that'd be 740.7, which is 741, and it'd become kilopascals. And then they took the negative off. That's fine. So yeah, we actually didn't need number two. But again, I'm totally glad I wrote it in there. Now, the thing that's interesting though, is could I, could I plug this number that we just calculated in right here and actually convert that, that stress of a force divided by an area, could I just turn it into one force? So it was like not measured now in kilopascals, but just in like kilonewtons or something like that. So it was like one force pushing on the top of the button, the plug. Yep. And frankly, when I read this question, I wasn't even sure what they were asking because I didn't think that was that, that clear. So technically, do you see how they have tons of arrows? That's kind of implying you can stop right here. There's not just one arrow. If there had been one arrow, then the answer might have been just newtons instead of Pascals. So, just for the fun of it, I'll just write it down because I did this. So, that N up there, which again is annoying, N for normal force and N for Newtons. So, how come it's smaller? That, that top one is 741,000. And then just a single arrow is only 524. Why is that so, it seems backwards. Do you see what I mean? It seems like the, the other one should be a lot larger. Because that's the amount of force you need on a point. And it has kilograms. But remember that stress is divided by area. 
And so notice the area of the top of that plug is really tiny. So when you take an, a force of 524, but then you divide by a teeny area, the number is going to grow. Because remember, if you measured the top of that in meters, it's really tiny. Why is our um, law our strain longitudinal? That would be our normal, right? That would be our normal strain. That's right. That's in but, the direction of the axial. Okay, so it is because, but it's because because a strain, a normal strain, is perpendicular to a surface. Right. That's right. But this, we're not really dealing with like a surface exactly. So is it because the axial pressure is going this way while the strain is coming down on it? Like that you can almost treat the axial pressure as the surface. Yeah. If you had like a solid piece of pipe like this, and so if I go inside here and kind of chop it, does it make sense? That's a little area of the circle right there. Yeah. And so normal strain is when I pull in this direction, let's say 500 pounds or something like that. So I take that force divided by that area and that's normal stress pulled in that direction. Normal stress, it's, this is perpendicular to the surface. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if I came over here yeah. and said, let's, you know, like scissors, let's slice this with the shear of 400 pounds, I still do the exact same thing. This is called shear stress. Normal stress, shear stress. I'm still going to take 400 divided by that area. So that's the difference between shear stress and normal stress. And, and of course, the important part of that is, is just how they behave. If I pull like this, it's going to pull apart. Whereas if I, you know, if I have a device like this and it's like this bolts these two things together and these two plates are trying to move, right? Does it make sense they're going to scissor it in half? So that's why they're that's why they're different because there are different forces that are going to defeat the structural strength of that kind of pipe right there. So they're both just whatever that force is divided by the area. It's just the direction of what they are. In a sense, this one is is parallel to the area, and this one is perpendicular to the area. Hard. Yeah. So I mean, I find myself looking back at stuff that I understood before and. Maybe getting a little more like at the time I felt like I understood it, and now I'm getting like, oh wait, I don't think I do now because it's like too many things to hold in your brain at once. So we have to know that for the next section. So if we get a shear force, does yeah. it, change? it changes probably the, the length, right? The bottom gets smaller, larger, maybe. Yeah. So whether a force is shear or normal is really important to keep straight. Hmm. Okay. Again, good news. This is this is the same question. Like we're still just trying to make sense of the same thing. Just trying to give you examples, talk about things. Um so let's see. A specimen, I like that word. Let's have a specimen. Diameter, 12.7 millimeters. Length, 50.8. So we're talking about kind of a piece of pipe that looks like this. This distance is 50.8 millimeters. And that diameter right there is 12.7 millimeters. Okay, so I got this piece of pipe, whatever. What am I doing to this? And notice I, when I read problems like this, I don't read it in order. I'm just kind of looking for stuff that makes sense to me. So I ended up skipping the whole first part because I was like stress strain diagram. And I'm thinking, I don't know why you're telling me that. I don't even know what I'm talking about. The second one, it's like, oh, it has a diameter and it has a length. So in my mind, when I read stuff like this, I'm like, 
Like I don't need that sentence anymore because I've got a picture of that now. If a load of 60 kilonewtons is applied to the specimen, okay, I'm going to apply 60 kilonewtons to this. Um, what am I assuming here that they did not tell me? Yeah, I'm assuming it's tension and that it's in the axial or normal direction, but it's like we just got done talking about it. It's like, I don't know how it was applied. Um, could be sideways. So, you know, in a sense, that's why sometimes these problems have a lot of extra words in them. So if, I, if you really understood things, you might question that. Would the diagram look different if you had compression and tension? Um, no. It's the only thing that's different is with respect to what we're learning now, because of the way I applied it, it's going to get longer and skinnier, right? If we applied it the other direction, it's going to get shorter and fatter. But that's actually not going to change the numbers. It's just going to change which one is negative and which one is positive. We'll still get the same numerical answers. So I don't know what direction it applies, and I don't even know it's it's tension. So I guess that problem's not worded very good, is it? Well, it doesn't matter, like you said, right? Yeah, but it won't matter. That's kind of interesting to know. So, and I'll I'll tell you also that when I did this problem, I drew it that way, but I didn't think I didn't even consider there was another option until like we're standing. It's one of the things I love about being a teacher because I don't. I'm forced to think about things a little more deeply. And then you guys ask me questions I don't know the answers to. And so we're trying try to all reason about this together, make sense of it. So, um, you know, that's that's another reason why I, I want you to have access to me to ask questions and stuff. Because anyway, that's the easiest way to apply it. So whatever. OK, cool. And so again, it's like, OK, cool. I applied that load to the specimen. And then they want to know the new diameter and the new length. Okay, that makes sense because it's going to get longer and the diameter is going to get smaller. And so this feels like, yeah, this feels like a question that we did before. And so again, I find myself thinking, you know, what equations do I have to work with here? Let's model that one more time. Let's see, what else do I have? And again, I don't even know, am I even going to need these equations? I don't know. And based on what we just learned a minute ago, I'm going to write E longitude in there for this for the first time, which I also didn't think about before. Did not occur to me that that was not obvious. And, you know, again, maybe I need more equations, but uh, maybe that's all I think of right now. Or maybe I get in the note sheet, just kind of look for every possible equation that I can you know, think of what, which I'm actually I'm not thinking of anymore right now. Seems like we just wrote like four of them and I can only think of those two. Is there another one we should write down? Oh, well, yeah, the strain one. I probably should write that one down. Strain was equal to the change of length divided by the length. Maybe this time I'll write D, like the change of dimension. Change of dimension divided by the original dimension. That way it doesn't have to just be length. Maybe that was confusing. Could make an axis like X and Y and call them distance and X, distance and Y. But it's like, remember that applies both directions. That'd be the 12.7 millimeters and also the 50.8. Notice the, notice the 60 kilonewtons goes nowhere in these calculations. Well, it could go somewhere. Yeah, sigma. So now I'm just going to start, you know, plugging this stuff in. I'm going to erase this, but remember we had that other equation, sigma equals n over a. Like I could have put 60 kilonewtons right there. Does that make sense? And then I know the area, and that would have given me sigma. Or in my case, I'm just going to say sigma is that force of 60 kilonewtons. Again, I'm going to write it like this, divided by the area. I know the area because the diameter is 12.7, so that'd be pi over four times. 12.7. Well, seems like millimeters is going to be better here. Maybe not. Maybe so. Maybe not. Maybe so. I'm not sure. I'm going to go meters. 0. 0.0. 
one, two, seven meters. And I kind of like writing that meters in there squared. So I know it's meters squared. So let's see, that'd be cool if they told me what kind of material it was, right? Because then I could know E in the back of the book, but they didn't tell me that. That seems kind of weird. So this is tricky, but what is this? What does this tell us over here? Like, what is this diagram? I kind of like this question. Like, what's that diagram? Oh. Instead of us just looking it up in the back of the book, it's like they gave us the stress strain diagram. Isn't E, isn't E the stress divided by the strain? So that was their nifty way of telling us E, I guess you could say. in the interest of time, because it's time to go. Dividing by 0 0.07, 490 gets way bigger. So this is gigapascals, which is 70 with nine zeros after it right now. So if you take 490 divided by 0 0.007, you get seven zero with nine more zeros. Well, remember megapascals is actually 490 with six zeros after it. So you might divide that on your calculator and see if you agree that that could be written as 70 gigapascals. It would be 70,000 megapascals. If you take 490 divided by 0 0.007, you get 70,000 and then it just stay megapascals. So it's like, ah, there's E. So that's, kind of, that's why they gave me that graph. And notice that's the end of the, what do we call that, the elastic area? That's the end of the elastic area. So that's the slope. The slope of that line is E. And I know the rise over the run. The rise is 490. The run is 0 0.007. Divide those. Hey, I got. So that's kind of interesting. Not realistic. Like in the real world, you'd have a material and you'd look it up in the back. But it, but the point is, is okay, cool. Then that means I know what E is. It's 70 gigapascals. So actually, that means if I took that 60,000 Newton number over there and divided by that. And notice I got some problems because units here, like do you agree that the units on the right are Newtons per square meter, which is good because that's what a Pascal is. So on the left side, I have Pascals, but I have 10 to the ninth of them. So I actually do have Newtons per square meter on both sides. So I'm actually okay. I just have to understand that number on the left is 70 times 10 to the ninth. So I'm gonna take that number on the right, 60, and I could change that to you know 60 kilonewtons and maybe, I don't know, but I just found myself getting confused by that stuff. I, I, I survived better the first time through this, just making everything newtons, everything meters, rather than trying to you know play footloose and fancy free with the units. So even though I lazily wrote 70 gigapascals, I'm actually gonna type in 70 times 10 to the ninth. So it's actually just pascals, newtons per square meter. I noticed they match. So if I take 60,000, Divided by all of that junk. Let's see, did I write this down someplace? I sure hope I did to save us some time. And I kind of did. So divided by divided by pi over four would actually be times four divided by pi. And then divided by 0 0.0127. So I'd square that number before I divide it. I got four, seven, three, six, four, blah, 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 blah. Now I'm going to divide by 70, and I'm also going to divide by 10 raised to the ninth. And I got 0 0.006. 0 0.00676. So I'm going to just call it that. So you're just multiplying 70 by 10 to the ninth. Yeah. So I put in the calculator 70 times 10 to the ninth. And so that seems reasonable in the sense that, now remember, that's not how much longer, that's the percent. So it's like half a percent. Move the decimal point two places to the right, 0.6%. So it's a little more than half a percent is what's going to happen in the length. 
So then I'm letting algebra do its work and I'm noticing sweet V is 0.35. So if I come back over here, I throw in 0.35 there and I just got done figuring out E longitude. Then that means I can find E latitude, which is gonna come out negative automatically. So I'm basically taking the number in my calculator times 0.35. It's still sitting in my calculator. So times 0.35, I got 0 0.002. 00237. So those are both unitless, they're percentages or millimeters per millimeter or whatever. And now armed with those two, it looks like I can actually do this last part. I just have two different, two different answers or two different problems to kind of do. So let's plug and chug. So if I do latitude here, and I know the original latitude size, the original depth of this thing is 12.7 millimeters. Notice I'm choosing to leave it as millimeters because the change in the change in its width, its dimension, if you will is going to be a tiny number. So I want that in millimeters. So I'm basically taking that negative number times 12.7. 12.7 times, I get roughly 0 0.0301. I'm going to write the word width here and length here, so I understand which ones I'm calculating. Now, that's literally its size change. It got smaller. Now, in the end, technically, if I look in the back, I'm not going to, that's not going to be the right answer, because what did it ask for? It said determine the new diameter. It didn't say how much the diameter change. It said what is the new diameter? Oh, okay. Well, then I'm going to have to take 12.7 and subtract that from it. Like that's the answer I'd actually see in the back. Do you agree with that? Off 0 0.03 millimeters. So what about the other one? Well, the other one was linked. So I've got this longitude number 00677. And I know the original diameter was 50.8 millimeters. So if I take that 0 0.0067 number times 50.8, I get that the change of D, maybe up here I say width and over here I say length is 0.3437, positive. I, pull, I chose to pull on it, so it got longer. The width got smaller. So if I mix that up, the back of the book would have been, you know, would be the opposite, but whatever. Anyway, we got longer, so I add that to 50.8. What do we get? Plus 50.8. So 50.8 plus the 0.3437 number, I get 51.14 approximately. So I, I know what its new size is going to be. Again, that's that's the, this is the same problem. We the first one we did in class. That's a good. Those are good straightforward ones. The first one was rectangular bar, and this was cylindrical. 
that's amazing that I can pulling on it, knowing its dimensions and what kind of material it's made out of, that I can actually determine what it's going to be sized like after the fact. That's pretty rad. I haven't made the test yet, but the first problem we did today in this one, although in this one I would tell you a material so you could look you up, I'm not going to give you a picture like that. That feels really, I don't want to say straightforward, but if I practice, I think I can do that. Again, my advice would be go home and do the assignment that pertains to this you know, right away. Also, you know, I'm, I'm making I'm making the note sheet as we go. So, you know, if there's something you want to discuss on the note sheet, like, hey, change change the way this is worded, you know, something to help us. I, I could see an argument for some of that today. All right, we'll stay after if you want to go out and. Thank you guys.